Wow, what a good day to be in the Lord's house. A lot going on. God is definitely doing many things. If you've been with us for a while, you're probably expecting me to say, turn to Romans chapter 8. Oh, it's already on the screen. Never mind, I can't surprise you. <laughs> We're not going to Romans chapter 8 today. Uh, we've been walking through the book of Romans, and we have really had a good time talking about the gospel and about how we walk in that gospel and what we're called to do, who we're called to be, what, who we are in Christ. And um, the last thing, we, we, we ended last week in Romans chapter 7, and we talked about the war that we fight. We talked about the battle that's raging in us as the flesh against the spirit, and we're fighting our sin, and we're, uh, we're walking in that way um, as we uh, uh, more and more clearly uh, come to see who we are in Christ. And to be honest, as we, we completed that, the last thing I told you, was that, um, you know, there's a whole lot of opportunities for you to get involved. If you want to get in the battle, if you want to get in the fight, you want to get in the game, uh, there's a whole lot of opportunities for you here. We have VBS coming up. We have this, uh, we're, he didn't mention it, but we're going to be making balloon animals at, at Old Settlers and handing out these million-dollar bills. Uh, we're going to talk about that. At, not real million-dollar bills, <clears throat> but it, it's going to be fun. We're going to be doing that tonight at 6. Uh, I'll be here a little earlier if you want to uh, come by, and we'll start on that. It's going to be a wonderful thing. So much going on. So much going on, and God is in the midst of it, and we're so thankful. Uh, it got me thinking this week about mission. It got me thinking this week about the mission that we're called to be on, the mission that we're called, what we're called to do, thinking about um, the mission of the church in general and how that relates to us here in, in Mulvane. And uh, simply, uh, Christ gave us a single mission as a church, and that is to make disciples. I mean, he, he gave us the commission that says, uh, right before he ascended into heaven, he said, you know, all power and authority is given unto me. And he said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them whatsoever I've commanded. He said, I'll be with you until the end of the age. That's what we're called to do. And I got to thinking about that as we, as we, there's that make disciples incorporates a whole lot of different things, a whole lot of facets. But really, you can almost boil it all down to being a testimony for Christ. When we, when we go out to evangelize the lost, that's the first thing we do. We go to, to make disciples. We, we convert them. We don't convert them, but God converts them through the gospel as we go out. And, and we are testifying to who Jesus is. And when we invest our lives in one another's lives, as we disciple one another, grow together, do life together, walk together, we're testifying as to who Jesus is as we walk this gospel out. We're testifying as to how this gospel actually plays out in our life. When we, when we serve people, when we serve each other, each other, serve the community, do the things that we're called to do, love one another. We're testifying of the love that we have been given by Christ by giving that love to others. We are testifying to who Jesus is over and over again and all the facets of the mission that we've been given to make disciples. And so what I, what I thought I, I couldn't get off of it, I really wanted to do Romans 8. That's going to take us some time because that is a really wonderful chapter. But I couldn't get off of John chapter 4 this week. And most of us have already heard, you, you probably know right where we're going, the woman at the well, that's a classic uh, witnessing uh, text, and you've probably read it many times and know the story. But I want to focus on what happens right after Jesus talks with that woman at the well. So as you turn to John chapter 4, let's pray together and ask God to bless our time together, for if he's not in it, if he does not show up and, uh, and uh, speak to our hearts, uh, then our time has been in vain. Father, we love you and we thank you. Thank you for the joy that we have been able to partake in as we have seen uh, all of these young people, all of these students come uh, and profess their faith publicly before us, God, in baptism. We, we thank you for the opportunity to be a part of that. God, I thank you for the people that have invested their lives in these young people. God, I thank you for all that uh, has gone on to lead us to this point. Thank you for those that are going on mission for you in a faraway land. God, we just pray today that you would be with us as we are here uh, dividing your word, as we're here seeking a word from you, Father. We're not here to hear a lecture. We're not here to hear a motivational speech, God. We're not here to uh, expand our intelligence. We're here to hear a word from you. So God, we pray that you would come and that your spirit would just change our hearts, that this word would come alive in our hearts, God, and that you would speak. Let me say everything that you want said and absolutely nothing that you don't want said today. And we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to go ahead and warn you. I'm going to try my best. Hopefully, I'm going to challenge you today about being on this mission, being on this mission of, 
of making disciples, being on this, this calling that Christ has given you. If you're a believer in Him, you are called to make disciples. You are called to be on mission for Him. So we're going to start in verse 31, but let me set up the context because we're going to jump right into the middle of the chapter. It's not something I usually like to do, but I want to set up what's going on. So in verse 1, it says, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied, that's important, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Jesus was wearied from his journey. He was hungry, thirsty. And verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Woman came out, Jesus said, give me a drink. His disciples had gone to buy him food. Why did they go buy him food? Altogether, because he was, yeah, he was hungry. He's weary. That's what he was. Okay, so you all know the story, right? He's there at Jacob's well. This woman comes out, woman from Samaria. They had this amazing conversation. Uh, she uh, doesn't know anything about anything when she gets there. She asks him, you know, why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan woman, and he wants water from her, and he explains who she is. He shows her her sin. By the time they're through, he says, you know, I know you. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. And he reveals who he is. She says, there's a Messiah coming, and he's going to show us all things. Jesus says, I'm him. And he shows her about worship and spirit and truth, not in this mountain, but in that mountain. And the whole thing culminates with her, I believe, coming to faith in Christ. And she goes back to the city to tell people about what she has just learned. In verse 31, or excuse me, verse 27, it says, after this conversation took, took, takes place, it says, just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, why, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar, went away into the town, and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And they went out of the town. The townspeople came out of the town and were coming to him. Okay, and here's where we're going to start. All the, I hadn't started preaching yet. All that was for free. <laughs> Verse 31 is where I want to begin. The context has been set. We're talking about as, right at this moment as his disciples are there, people are streaming out of the town coming to see Jesus based on this woman that had gone back to the town and said, look, come see a man. The Christ is here. Is this him? And all of these people are coming out. And what Jesus does here is simply amazing to me. He takes some time as he's on the cusp really of a revival happening in this little town in Samaria, he takes the time to instruct his disciples about mission, about what they're supposed to be doing, about what we're called to be doing, and it's an instruction that you and I need to hear today. The first thing that he says about this mission is the one that I want you to get the most. I'm going to give you four points today as we work through chapter 40, uh, verse 31 through 42. We're going to go quick too. I'll speak fast if you listen fast. And so the first point is really one I want you to get, okay? The other three are pretty much, if you're a believer, you've been a believer, I'm pretty much just going to tell you something you already know, I think. But so many people miss this first thing that Jesus says. The first thing I want you to see is our mission, our mission nourishes our own soul. Okay? So many times we think that it's just a duty. It's a, it's a laborious task. It's something, oh, this is what I got to do. I got to go be on mission. I'm supposed to be a witness. Jesus, he says, meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. They see these people coming. There is a crowd of people streaming to him from this city based on this woman's testimony. They, he was already weary. The disciples knew that he was weary. That's the reason they went to get food. And when they came back with the food, they see these people coming. And they say, Jesus, you've got to eat now. You've got to take care of yourself. You're going to burn out, Jesus. You're, gonna, you're not going to be able to do all this. You, you, you need to take some time for you. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. So the disciples, of course, they didn't understand, said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus, clarifying, said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Now, I want you to think about this. I want you to think, to be honest, if I'm the disciples or no one, he's hungry. If I'm Jesus, I, I really would, you know, 
if you're, if you're hungry, you could say, I, I probably would have scarfed it down and said, okay, hurry up, let's hurry up and eat this stuff. Uh, to be honest, if nobody was coming, I probably would have scarfed it down anyway. But I would have said, yeah, I got to eat in disorder. I told him this morning, I got to eat in disorder. I'll eat disorder of fries and disorder of chicken wings. And, uh, but if, I, if you're Jesus there and you want to show the disciples that it's more important for us to minister than to eat right now, why not just say, not right now. Let's, let's put it aside. It's not important to eat. Let's do what, what we're called to do. Why go through all of this thing? It's almost like he challenges them, doesn't it? He says, the, 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 word, the two words, I and you, are emphatic in verse 32. He says, but he said to them, I have food that you don't know about. It's almost like he's saying, why don't you know about this food that I have? He's telling them, he's showing them that you should have this food. You should understand what's going on right here. Eat, are you crazy? Look at all these people coming. He is taking the time to challenge them and to teach them something about what's going on right here. And it's something that we need to know. He's basically, uh, he's basically showing us that the same thing that food is to the body is what doing the will and the work of God is to him, to Jesus, to his soul, to his spirit. He's, he's showing them that, I mean, think about it. Let's just be honest. The drive, the, the drive when you're hungry to eat is powerful. It's more powerful in some of us than it is in others. It's powerful. Uh, some sociologists did a, did a study one time about people being deprived of food. I'm not talking about like right now I'm hungry and we're thinking about lunch. I'm talking about not having something to eat for like three days. Real hungry. I'm talking about really being hungry. When you deprive somebody of food, something happens psychologically in them and that's all they can think about. That's the drive, the purpose of their life. Everything is about where my food is coming from. When you get to the point where you are hungry and don't know where that meal is coming from, everything you think about is where is that food coming from? I've got to get that food. And it's also been noticed that when you satisfy that, when you give someone like that some food, the very next moment, the first thought in their mind is, where is my next meal coming from? It's all about that drive. Jesus is telling them here, look, my food, what sustains me, what energizes me, what nourishes me, what feeds me is not just uh, getting my physical needs fed. He says, what feeds me is doing the will of God. This is my food. This is my, this is my sustenance. Think about it this way. Let me give you an example. Um, it's a whole lot easier for us when we talk about eating to just eat junk, isn't it? It's a whole lot easier for me anyway because it's satisfying. I mean, when you get that big greasy cheeseburger with grease just dripping and, and you be real quiet, you can hear your arteries hardening, it just it's so good. It's so good and it satisfies, right? But the satisfaction that comes from that, we all know that if you eat like that all the time, it's going to take a toll on your body. And there's going to come a day when you're not going to last too long. But eating healthy, when you eat healthy, and, and I'm not the proponent for eating healthy for sure, but when you eat healthy, you realize that there's going to be a benefit. You feel better. You feel better. You, there's a benefit to life. You, you last longer. You know, those things, that's a real benefit. Jesus is telling them here, look, the satisfaction of my comfort, my physical needs, the things that I need. Jesus wasn't saying I don't need to eat. He did, in fact, need to eat. He was a real man. But he was saying this over here is more satisfying than anything else that you can provide me. His fuel, his satisfaction was greater in doing the will of God than in meeting any physical need, meeting any of the needs he had. Isn't it so much easier just to, to live for yourself? We have a tendency, just even as believers, I don't know how many in here is lost or how many saved, but even as believers, we have a tendency to fall into this mindset of seeking our own comfort in our own comfort, to seeking our satisfaction in the things that benefit me, to seek satisfaction in my fun and my entertainment and the things that comfort my body and the things that do with me. And what we're doing is we're taking and we're, we're being satisfied with a lower level of satisfaction because you were designed to do the will of God. You were designed to serve him. You were designed to worship him. All the way back in the Garden of Eden, God gave Adam a command. He said, be fruitful and multiply. Spread my image across the world. And you know what happened. He sinned and that became impossible. And Jesus came rectifying that in his death, burial, resurrection. And now he gives us the same command. 
Be fruitful and multiply. But now it sounds like this. Go forth and make disciples. Spread my image is what he's saying. Spread my image over this creation. That is what you were designed to do. If I eat junk all the time, I'm going to feel bad. I'm going to be fat and lazy. I'm going to destroy my physical health. If I don't do, as a believer, do the will of God, the same thing's going to be ha- going to happen. I'm going to get fat and lazy. I'm going to destroy my spiritual health. Um, Charles Spurgeon said it this way. I put the quote. It's kind of a long quote. When he preached this text, this text right here, he said this in one of his sermons. I love this. He walked up into the pulpit of the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London, and he said, Some of you good people who do nothing except go to public meetings... The Bible readings and prophetic conferences and other forms of spiritual dissipation would be a good deal better Christians if you would look after the poor and needy around you, if you would just tuck up your sleeves for work and go and tell the gospel to dying men. You would find your spiritual health mightily restored for very much of the sickness of Christians comes through their having nothing to do. He said, all feeding... And no working makes men spiritual dyspeptics. That means you're ill and you're cantankerous and you're ornery. Those are Tennessee words. Look them up. (laughs) Be idle. He said, be idle, careless, with nothing to live for, nothing to care for, no sinner to pray for, no backslider to lead back to the cross, no trembler to encourage, no little child to tell of a Savior, no gray-headed man to enlighten in the things of God, no object, in fact, to live for. And who wonders if you begin to groan? and to murmur, and to look within until you're ready to die of despair. Understand what he's saying. Understand what Jesus was telling. Jesus didn't just say, hey, I get my my sustenance from from food. I mean, I get my sustenance not from food, but from doing the will of God. He challenged his disciples. He said, I have some food that you guys don't know anything about. He was telling them, why don't you understand what's happening right here? All these people are coming out from Samaria and you're trying to get me to eat. He said, this is my food. This is my food to do the will of God. This is what nourishes me. The conversation I just had with this woman from Samaria, this is what energizes me. This is what nourishes me. This is what my purpose is. This is what I live for. Not my own comfort, not my own needs, not my own things. You really need to understand this because so often in our Christian lives, we start thinking, oh, I got to go to work. Jesus wants me to go out and hang out with the kids. Jesus wants me to go out and do evangelism. Jesus wants, oh, man, I can't wait till I get home. That is not the service that we're talking about. This is not just for them, it's for us. It nourishes our soul when we do the will of God. It nourishes our soul. It grows us. There is a greater satisfaction in doing what you were designed to do, serve and worship the living God, than any other satisfaction you could possibly find, physical or otherwise. It nourishes your own soul to be on mission for Christ. And when we deny that mission, when we slip, and it's easy to do, when we slip off into living for my own comfort, living for my own stuff, living for my own ways, what can I get out of this? Just uh, the daily grind of life and doing the things that I want to do, the things that I think make me, uh, give me rest and sustain me. No wonder we start feeling like there's something wrong because we are designed to be on mission for Christ. We are designed to be serving and worshiping God. That's what we're here for. So he says, our mission, making disciples, includes evangelizing, includes investing in one another, it includes growing with one another, it includes serving one another, it it includes serving the community, reaching out to the lost. These things nourish our own soul. The second thing that he says I want to show you is that the mission is urgent. It's right now urgent. He says to them, do you not say there are, there are yet four months then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. I, I get this picture in my mind. It's not in the Bible, but it's just me thinking that Jesus, when he says this, he turns and points at all of these Samaritans that are cresting the hill about to come to him because this woman has went and given her testimony to them. He says, lift up your eyes over here and look. The fields are white for harvest. He says, when you, when you harvest, when you plant and you sow, farmers in here, you probably know, it, you wait. 
I mean, you, you sow your seed and you wait for the, for the growth to happen, for the things to happen. Jesus says, look, this is not the time for waiting. This is not the time to sit back and say, you know, we have time. We've got all the time in the world. I'll get that done tomorrow. I'll get that done next week. He says, the fields are white for harvest right now. Look at them coming. They're coming right here. Folks are streaming to Jesus. It's always urgent, his mission. There's always opportunity. Everywhere that your foot falls, whether it be to go to work, whether it be to go to school, in your own home, in your own neighborhood, everywhere that your foot touches, you are on mission for Christ. You are to be a testimony for Christ. I'm not just talking about you standing up on a soapbox and preaching to a crowd. I'm talking about you giving testimony to who this Jesus is. The time is right now. It's true then when Jesus spoke it, and it's true right now. Our mission's urgent. The third thing I want you to see is that our mission, this is very important, it includes all of us. It includes every single believer. If you are saved today, born again by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God dwells in you, you are eternally secure, and Jesus has paid for your sins. You have given Him your life and trusted Him. You are called to be on mission. I don't care who you are, I don't care how old you are, how young you are, how out of shape you are, with the weaknesses that you think you have, the inabilities you think you have, you are called to be on this mission. He said already, the one who reaps, that's the one who's seeing this harvest come into play. He says the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life. The people that are coming and receiving eternal life. So that, look what he says, the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. And he tells the disciples, I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you've entered into their labor. Understand, I would love to tell you, it's a great thing when you get to see, how many was it, eight people baptized? Get to see eight people come to know Christ all at one time. It's almost like the harvest has come in. But I'm here to tell you today, and I've only been here since December, but I know for a fact that the eight people that got baptized this morning, that professed their faith in Christ, that trusted in Jesus and were saved, that's the culmination of people sowing seeds in their life for all kinds of days, all kinds of weeks, all the time that they've been here, the people that have helped them, the people that have counseled them, the people that have loved on them as they have been in youth, as they have gone on trips, as they've been walking around in the hallways, the people that have seen one or more of them crying in the hallway and stopped to console them, that is the fruit of a lot of labor that's going on. And so you understand that most of the time, I would say, I'm going to go ahead and say most of the time, what we're doing is we're sowing seeds. We are sowing seeds for the kingdom. And it says that there's joy in that. Look, when the harvest comes, the reaper gathers the fruit, he says, right? And in verse 36, he says, so the sower and the reaper can rejoice together. I used to, I, I know a guy this guy witnessed to an oak tree. I'm telling you, he just it, anybody he would see. And there was something, God just blessed him in such a way that I don't know how it happened, but I mean, people would come to know Jesus just in talking to him. And you know, there were times where I would sit with this other person that was lost and wanting to, you know, ask questions and all that. And I would talk to him for three hours. I would try to answer questions and try to show him, look, come on, this is what you need to do. I mean, just laborious. And the guy with this guy I'm talking about, he'd walk in and go, you know, Jesus loves you. And they'd go, oh, I need to be saved. I'm like, what is that? I've been here three hours and nothing happened. And all of a sudden you just come in as a, but the sower and the reaper, they, they work together. God has given, it's God that gives the increase. One waters, one plants, God gives the increase. And you are called to sow seeds. Today, uh, the, a couple of weeks, we got VBS coming up. You're going to be sowing seeds. I'm talking about seeds for eternal life into the lives of children, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And you know what? Sometimes those seeds won't be realized. You won't see the fruit of that in your lifetime. You'll see it in eternity, but not in your lifetime. Sometimes the seeds that we sow, we don't get to see the harvest. We don't get to see the immediate results. But that doesn't make it any less part of the mission of Christ. 
We have this old settlers thing coming up where we're going to be talking to people. We're going to be making balloon animals for the kids. We're going to be handing out tracts and having gospel conversations. And you know what? We might not see a thousand people come to know Jesus as we walk there, but we are planting seeds that God is going to use in their life down the road. And we will see and rejoice at the harvest that, has come, that comes from that. But it may be an eternity. Look what it says. The one who's reaping, there is... He's receiving his wages, gathering fruit to eternal life is what it says. Remember, back then, there were no John Deere's, there were no, you know, no GPS tractor things, there wasn't refrigeration. So there was just a joy in harvesting. The joy in harvesting a crop was you get to eat fresh food for a month or two months, however long. You know, you've been eating all year long, spreading this food out, spreading this crop out, and, you know, to be honest, toward the end of the year, it gets kind of nasty, <laughs> And so there's a joy in the work of harvesting. Sowing's not always such a joy. Because remember, sowing back then involved an ox and a plow. If any of y'all remember doing that, that stinks. That's no fun at all. He says, look how he characterizes it. He says, the reaper, the one who's reaping, the one who's seeing the culmination of this harvest, is receiving wages, gathering fruit for eternal life. Look what he says about the sower, though. Verse 38, he says, I sent you to reap for what you did not, what? Labor. That word is labor. It doesn't, it's not the normal word for work. It's the word for labor, toil. He said, the sowers have been laboring. Others have labored, and you, my friend, have entered into their labor. This sowing of seeds is work, Jack. It's work. It's hard work. And you know what? You don't always get to see the fruit of it. But it's no less important than the, than the fire-breathing evangelist that comes to town and 40,000 people come to know Jesus. It's no less important because seeds had been sown in all of those people's lives through the course of their life by neighbors and friends and grandmothers and parents and people at church and, and youth ministers and, and people that have invested in them. Seeds have been sown throughout all of that. Our mission involves every single one of you. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what you think your weaknesses are, your inabilities. You can sow seeds for the kingdom of Christ. You can sow seeds in the lives of children that we're going to be ministering to here at First Baptist. You can, I, I don't care what it is, everything that we do, it adds to what we are called to be doing. What I mean by that is, even something as simple as cutting the grass, cleaning the floors, things that you wouldn't think of. People will walk past it going, that ain't my job, not my job, I don't have, that's not what I do, that's not... Those things, and I'm not saying y'all all need to go cut the grass. I'm saying we are called as a body to be on mission together. And every little piece of that mission is sowing a seed into the lives of people that's going to reverberate through eternity. Seeds, fruit for eternal life. The last thing I want you to see before we go is that our mission is to point people to Jesus. It's that simple. With all of this, I, I can feel, because of what Jesus has said so far, that there's kind of a, a weight, a responsibility. Oh, it's up to me. No, it's not up to you. It's up to Jesus. So we point people to him. We, I can't save anyone. You can't say It's not our responsibility to succeed. It's our responsibility to be obedient. And Jesus is the one that gives the increase. He says, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. She went back and told them. He told me all that I ever did. That was her testimony. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. And then this is what they said, verse 42. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves. And we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. What we do in every aspect of our discipleship, in the fall we're going to talk more about FBC's role in discipleship, 
Every aspect of discipleship, we are pointing people to Jesus. That's what we do. In evangelism, we are we're telling people, look, come meet a man. This is the man who can save you. This is God and man, the Son of God that came to die for your sins. Come meet this man. Come see this man. When we invest in one another's lives and we walk together and grow each other, we're pointing to Jesus saying, this is how Jesus walked. This is how we are to walk. When we serve one another, when we serve the community, we are saying, this is how Jesus has loved us so let us love you in that way we are pointing to him and so all of our efforts all of our mission are to point to christ and he provides the increase it's not our responsibility to do anything other than point people to jesus the woman's testimony we didn't get it it was really simple it's not up to my arguments it's not up to my intellect it's not up to my speaking ability it doesn't matter about how good or how bad i can present the gospel or i can turn the conversation or i can do it does none of that matters the gospel we read in romans chapter one is the power of god into salvation all i have to do is present it and god will provide the increase and you know what if somebody says that's the stupidest thing i've ever heard you're an idiot for believing that i say bye you can't eat me and you can't take my birthday i'm gonna move on to the next person It's not up to me. The gospel is the power of God. That is freeing. Because it's not up to how good I can do it. It's not up to how wonderful a person I am or or how I can craft an argument to get around what... It's up to God. All I have to do is present it. All I have to do is point to Jesus and say, here he is. Here he is. And the powerful Christ saves. The powerful Christ grows people. It's up to him, not me. All I have to do is to be obedient. There's an old joke where this guy came and down to the front of a church and professed faith in Christ. Uh, and the church, you know, they were excited. And then, then for the next two months, he proceeded to go out and just live horrendously. He just went out and... Through the whole town, he was cussing people out, you know, beating his wife, you know, doing all kinds of just awful, awful things. And a guy came up to that pastor and he said, you remember Joe? He said, you saved him, didn't you? And the pastor said, I must have because Jesus didn't have nothing to do with that. (laughs) It's not for us. All we do is, all we do is do what Christ told us. Go. We go and we make disciples. We invest in one another. We do life, walk together in one another, showing each other, building off each other, iron sharpening iron. We go out into the world where the lost are and we present the message of Christ. We present it and we point people to Jesus. The woman's testimony was so simple. She told people what she knew about Christ and what Christ had done for her. You say, I can't, I don't know how to witness to anybody. You, are you saved? Tell them how you got there. That's all you have to do. Who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Simple as that. You don't have to have great theological arguments. She came back and she said, come meet a man that told me everything about myself. Is this not the Christ? There's a quote from Richard Phillips as the praise team comes up. He said this. He said, the majority of people are won to Christ by a heartfelt testimony and an invitation to church or Bible study where they encounter Jesus for themselves the responsibility as we come tonight and we start learning about evangelism and 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 getting ourselves ready to to uh, engage people with balloons or whatever it is we decide to do the point is not just to go do something the point is that we are called to be on a mission and that mission is to point people to jesus Whether it's in the realm of evangelism, point lost people to the Savior. Whether it's in the realm of discipleship, where we're growing one another as we all look to Jesus together and help each other walk. We are to point people to Christ. You are called. If you're a believer, I don't know who's lost and who's saved. This hadn't been a very evangelistic message today, but you are called to be on mission. Can you put your finger on a place where you're sowing seed? Where you're sowing seed in the kingdom, for the kingdom, in the lives of whoever.
anyone. Can you put your finger and say, you know, right here is where I am. I haven't seen much increase. I haven't seen uh, what I would consider fruit. I haven't seen, but this right here is where I'm sowing seeds. This is where I'm on mission for Christ. Can you put your finger there? And if not, why not? It's not for the preacher, the Sunday school teacher, the, the scholar, the whatever to do the mission of Christ. It's for the believer. It's for all the believers. So you need to understand, number one, Please understand this. If you don't hear anything else, hear this. The mission that we're on, it nourishes your own soul. It's not just a duty. It's not just a toil that we do because that's what we're supposed to do. It nourishes your own soul. It's urgent. It needs to be done right now. And part of that mission may be for you just to be sowing seeds in the lives of people. And it's always, always, always pointing people to Jesus. That's what we do. That's who we are. So, as I said last time, we have a lot of opportunities for you to get involved here. We have a lot of people that are coming that need to, need to join with us, that need to join this church, that need to uh, get involved in the ministries that we're doing and the outreaches that we're doing and planting the seeds in children's lives in all of the things that are going on. I'm not saying you can't do it somewhere else. I'm not saying this is the only church that does anything for God. But I'm saying you're sitting here right now. We have to be on mission at all times, in all ways. Invest yourself in the kingdom of God because I promise you, I was a hospital chaplain for many years. I promise you, there's going to come a day when you're in that hospital bed and there ain't no getting out. And the doctor says, this is it. On that day, the seeds that you sown in people that lead to eternal life, that exalt Christ, that make much of His kingdom. On that day, it's going to be a whole lot more important to you than it is today. If you don't know Christ, you're not even ready to get on this path. You're not even ready to get on this mission. You have to trust in Jesus. You have to give Him your heart. You have to do what all these young people have done as they came and they publicly professed what they've done on the inside. They've trusted in Jesus. And if you're a believer here with us today, if you're a visitor here with us today, and you know Christ, and you start sowing your seeds, He's given you the Word of God, He's given you the gospel message, the most powerful thing you can possibly imagine. What are you doing with it? Get busy for Christ. Will you stand with me? I'd be right here. I'd love to pray with you.